Welcome to the Swike Podcast, the only podcast that shares the stuff you didn't know you needed to know about jobs, careers, and life. The Swike Podcast, the stuff I wish I knew earlier. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Swike Stuff I Wish I Knew Earlier podcast. We're here with one of our new guest hosts, uh, Grady Gunawan, and uh, we thought he'd have a little bit of a conversation on, on his background. So, Grady, how are you doing today? I'm good. Lucky, how are you? I'm fantastic as always. So uh, Grady comes to us with a background in, in kind of business marketing, sales, business development, and he's been uh, around the world working in different places. Um, so Grady, if you can share a little bit about what you're doing now, and then we'll go back in time and kind of uh, get you as a kid. So what are you up to these days? Okay, thanks, Lucky, for having me. Um, thanks for this uh, uh, conversation. So um, yeah, um, uh, so my name is Gwadi Gunawan, so, and I'm, I'm currently working for one of the largest uh, online food delivery company in Canada. Uh, so we try to expand, uh, not just in the restaurant verticals, but we try to expand beyond for restaurant for verticals. So we try to expand to uh, verticals such as alcohol convenience and grocery store. And I, was, I am tasked to uh, lead a team of eight at this moment. Uh, and our job is to grow the, the, the business of our partners. So our partners needs to be coached and educated how to use our software to make sure that they get more orders from our platform and make sure that uh, our partners perform well, both commercially as well as operationally. Great. Sounds like a, a bunch of things that you're doing uh, leading a team of eight. But I'd love if we could rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, Grady as a kid. So what was Grady like growing up? Uh, maybe some early uh, fond childhood memories. So what were you like growing up as a kid? Well, I mean, uh, as a kid, it's, it's pretty much I love sports. So I don't have a lot of uh, ideas at, at the time. I just love football, soccer here. I mean, in Canada, we call it soccer, right? So yeah. I, I love soccer and uh, I think that's embedded in me. So because I love soccer, uh, I always have this uh, curiosity over other countries because I think soccer is one of the, the most uh, globalized sports in the world. Uh, and through soccer, I learned a lot about other countries. I, I browse a lot of countries in Africa, Asia, uh, Europe, especially. And uh, it, it influenced me in a way because since 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 then, um, I, I have these aspirations that one day I want to live in multiple countries. Uh, and, you know, being a footballer, if, if you follow that, I think uh, you have a, a huge opportunities to, uh, to live in multiple different countries. So I think that's influenced me in a way that someday when I have a career, I also want to live in multiple countries. Um, I think that's, uh, but pretty much in, in terms of my character, I'm pretty shy. I'm not really super outgoing, uh, pretty analytical. I think that's kind of behavior that I, I observed when I was a kid. And I pretty much um, numbers driven, to be honest. It's kind of kind of strange because I remember back in those days, I uh, I collected uh, basketball cards, NBA cards, and I always remember, memorized the average point per game, uh, block per game, those kind of uh, okay. stats. And I think that, that's something that, you know, that carries with me as of now, because I always be a number driven guy. I always uh, analyze numbers and stuff like that. So, so yeah, that's pretty much when I was a kid. Yeah. And as we're recording this, like the, the World Cup is on. So I, I don't know if there's a team that you're supporting particularly. Uh, I live in Japan, so I kind of support Japan and uh, before. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, they perform really well right now, but uh, obviously I'll, I'll also support Canada. But, uh, yeah, uh, as of now, as we speak right now, I don't think Canada is performing that well. But, yeah, I think those, those two yeah. countries that I support now. For sure. And and obviously that can be a little bit polarizing for everybody, but I mean, like uh, to, to each your own, right? So this is one where it's a global sport, but at the same time, it can create a lot of uh, friends and enemies at the same time, right? But usually it's it's a, a friendly rivalry, which which, which is nice. Um, I, and I'd love if you chat a little bit about kind of some of the influences that, that uh, came along the way. So um, you said numbers driven and things like that. Did, did mom and dad want you to become like uh, an accountant, uh, an engineer, that sort of thing? Because usually numbers people become one of those two. Or were you influenced to become like, like the doctor, lawyer? Is, is the other options as well? Well, interestingly, no. I think my parents, they pretty much give me a lot of freedom to do what I want. Obviously, they're, they're, okay. they're quite hesitant for me being a footballer because, you know, back in my, <laughs> uh, in Indonesia, I don't think we have a lot of opportunities to, be, you know, to earn, uh, you know, a good income by being a footballer unless you are a um, national player. Um, so, yeah, it's not something that they are, uh, they are keen for me to have that, that kind of career. Obviously, I also think about money as well. I mean, as as you know, uh, if you wanna you you, you wanna have a great career and you wanna earn a good a good uh, income as well, right? So, I never thought about being a footballer, but obviously, um, as I as I grew up, I think it, it comes within me that 
you know that that sense of living in multiple co countries is always be with me and one of the things that uh, that i know of is that uh, business so when i when i study in university i'm not really sure where i want where i want to go so i just took a very uh, generic um, subject or major which is industrial engineering so no, so if you don't know what you want to do <laughs> just take the generic one so you still have the opportunities later on to you know to cope with the uh, something uh, special uh, you know more specific if, if you want so um yeah i took that industrial engineering and uh but you know that kind of sense that i want to go live abroad in multiple countries still there so that's why i feel like i just i think i just need to go to business and at the time what i know is that i just want to work for a multinational companies because that will give you an opportunity to live uh, to go abroad and working in different countries sounds good and if you walk us a little bit through kind of that transition from industrial engineering uh, to kind of the, the business world? Like, was that like a clear intent during that time to say, you know what, I'm going to do industrial engineering and then I'm going to do business? Or is it more like, I don't know, uh, I'm going to do industrial engineering. And then you finally found that, okay, yeah, I'm going to go into business. If you can talk a little bit about that. Um, pretty much, I don't know. I mean, when I when I choose <laughs> industrial engineering at, at that time, it's because um, that that is the, the major that at least in, in Indonesia at the time is pretty popular. So if you don't know what mm -hmm. you do, just go into something popular. But not so specific, uh, not like a doctor, because, you know, doctor, you need a, you know, a lot of more specializations and more time to study. Sure. So I just took it because I know that, you know, if you go to university, you need to spend four years at least. So at least this is four years. It's not going to be six, seven or eight years. And this is pretty um, uh, a major that is highly recognized by the employer because, you know, you are you are from a tech, technical background. Right. So you're an engineer in a way, although I, I never use or apply that skills. <laughs> anymore uh, until now uh but yeah I, pretty much i don't know what what i want um and i just choose that and i feel like okay this is safest bet and then after that maybe i can use this diploma to apply the you know job for a multinational company um yeah so that's pretty much it but but obviously you know uh it, when it comes to business i think it's it you know it's self-taught most of the time so when i was like 18 19 at, at, the, at the time i remember that that's the first time there is a business week magazine in in jakarta so i think there is an indonesian version uh indonesian version of a business week so i start to read that uh, magazine a lot and it influenced me that oh okay I, I really want to go to the business world because i think this is this is same with football right there is a lot of uh you know big football team and in business there is a lot of large companies uh, these large companies they have presence in many different countries so in in, in a way there is a s similar principles that I, I could apply from uh, football to business and uh yeah and then for me it's just to choose which functions that i want to play you know in football you have strikers midfielders defenders in the business you have you know you have sales you have marketing you have finance so and so forth so just make sure that which positions that i want to play in, in this business world to make sure that i'm setting up myself for success um so yeah uh, so pretty much i don't know what i want to do but i just want i just know that i need to go to business and uh after i graduated uh i don't know where what industry that i want to target uh, what i know is that i want to work for large multinational so i just apply any you know any to any company irrespective of the industry as long as there are large right. multinationals yeah and and then can you walk us through a little bit about like like landing that first job so this is uh when you graduated industrial engineering or had you had you already taken uh, your, your mba at this time oh so i haven't taken my mba so after i graduated from industrial engineering i applied to a couple okay. of you know large multinationals i got accepted uh for my first job at citibank which is uh in the banking industry and it's a large uh, american company right uh unfortunately it didn't work well with me uh the the nature mm -hmm. of industry i don't think it fits with me so i'll just be there for a year and after that uh i quit from the company um and after that i think i i've been through a lot of you know self search process like trying to understand myself because i don't want to you know uh make this uh, wrong or erroneous move again after this after after that citibank case um yeah. after that what i what i realized myself so wh what i'm what i'm trying you know to understand is that i try to learn myself like, who am i because you know although you are you does not mean that you understand you right so there is a continuous process that i'm trying to understand who am i actually and what do i like um so it it's now it came it came to me that uh, actually you know cbg consumer product industry is quite interesting because every time i go to a supermarket i go to groceries i always see the packaging of a product i always see the aisle i will see how they're you know these companies are presenting their uh, product in the 
in the shelf in the supermarket. So I started to have th that thoughts and as that's why I started to apply it to a lot of, you know, um, um, FMCG or fast moving consumer goods company in Indonesia. And especially in Indonesia, it's a large market for a uh, large uh, multinational uh, consumer product company. So there, there are tons of companies in, in Indonesia and I, I apply that. So it's, it's a very, I would say, slow process because it's not easy actually to get that job. And uh, finally, after I think I'm waiting for one and a half years. So I worked for a manufacturing company first before I got a job in FMCG, but I know that I want to go to FMCG. Um, so I got a job finally in a, uh, in a Kraft Foods. And now it's called Amondelis International, but but yeah, they're, they're mm -hmm. also one of the largest uh, American uh, FMCG company back then. Sounds good. And can you walk us through, so you kind of attained your, your dream of, of, of uh, attending, of going into one of the multinational companies. And so far, it seems like what well, you spent quite a bit of time there. So it must have been pretty decent. Uh, when did the, the NBA happen? Was that like while you were there or, or elsewhere? Or how so, did you decide to kind of solidify your, your, your uh, spot in business? So yeah, after after I, I worked for a while in Kraft Foods, um, you know, Sometimes when you see career, when you build a career, it's kind of it's like a storyline, right? So uh, there, are, you know, mm -hmm. if you watch a movie, there is a, some sort of aspect in the movie that that determines whether the the, the movie is a, is a good quality or not, right? You know, um, the same thing with with my career. I think uh, if I want to continue to work in a consumer product, there is a couple of factors that I need to identify. For example, function. What is the the function that uh, allows me to 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 be uh, so to be uh, more visible in the industry, you know, is it sales, is it marketing, or is it the finance, those kind of stuff. And also, second, for example, second perspective is that uh, the geographical exposure, because, you know, consumer business means that the more you understand your consumer, um, the better, the, the more available you are, or the more attractive you are as a talent in the market. And uh, I understand that if I just stay in Indonesia, uh, it, it may not expand my career further because, or maybe I could expand, but it just, it could, it, it, it will it, it will take longer you know longer time because I have to spend years of years in my career in Indonesia. So, one of the things that I want right. to uh, expand is if my is, uh, is, was my geographical exposure. So that's why I started thinking why not just doing an MBA because with, with MBA you mm -hmm. studied abroad and then you can get get job uh, overseas and then you can start to expand again your understanding about the market in the uh, in in other in another region. So that's why I started thinking about MBA. And also on top of that, I always want to be, you know, competitive, um, having some, you know, um, credentials uh, stick with my name um, from a reputable university is something that I look for as well. So I think that 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 works well with me. So that's why I, I decided to take an MBA. Sounds good. And the MBA was was in, in Rotterdam, so in the Netherlands. Uh, can, can you yeah, describe the process at, at, to, to select that one? Yeah. So at the time, I, I actually my, you know, I really want to go to go to US for the MBA because I feel like US business schools is uh, the most attractive for me. And on top of that, I think uh, US is also the market that values MBA. But that's my personal perspective um, because you know okay. they have a full report of you know the the the, uh, the students who are who are graduated and uh, the job markets and so forth. I think uh, it, yeah, I think for me initially US, but at the time it's really bad timing. It was two thousand and eight. You know the global financial crisis. Mm. So it really, you know, affects the way I think whether I want to do an MBA because uh, in US you spend two years and if you don't get a job after two years spending a lot of resources. So I, I'm, I really think about that. Uh, so th that's why I decided to go to Europe. Europe normally shorter version, uh, 12 months, 15 months, that kind of uh, duration. So that's why I choose uh, Rotterdam School of Management. So I applied to a couple of uh, top business school in Europe, but uh, I think Rotterdam School of Management or RSM is the one that accepted me first. So I just took that, uh, took that uh, opportunities. Okay. And, and how was the process or the, um, did it meet the expectations of what you wanted for, for an MBA? Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the one thing that, that I learned, if you go to, if you go to good university, uh, most probably you will get a good network because you know the the, the filter or the selection of the process of the university itself uh, will enable you to having you know to have a good network because normally if it's a good university they will select uh, highly competitive students. Obviously, there is a bit of competition inside right. the program itself between students, but you know if you focus on a friendship, if you focus on a networking, I think uh, that's that is more important to build a lifelong connection with a highly competitive uh, you know colleagues. Um, that one, I don't regret. I think that's the best one of the best decision. 
and that's the first time as well i got exposure with the outside you know outside of uh, asia uh, european market mm-hmm. um i think the downside is that maybe for for uh, you know uh, working in sales if you don't speak a local language that will not give you any advantages uh, you know to to get a job in the local market right so i think that's something that mm. i i should prepare first uh, in, in the first place before i took that uh, took that route to go to netherlands i should learn dutch first and become fluent before taking that right uh yeah study but again uh it yeah that that diploma alone and that credential alone uh, didn't give me any adv- advantages um uh, position to uh to take it uh, to get a job in in netherlands or in europe at large so that's why i have i had to go, go back home at the time after i after i after my graduation sounds good so so you did that and then but you ultimately still did like an internship in in the netherlands was that part of a different program yeah. or how, how did yeah, that part happen? of the program but unfortunately at the time a uh, european was in crisis 2012 2013 so uh, it, it was never a good timing for me i don't know why uh I got I did I did an internship for four months, uh, but unfortunately they don't have uh, headcounts or permanent headcounts that they can open up for me. So once the program is over, okay. once the the, the study is over, so I, they have to uh, end they have to end the internship as well. Okay, so, sounds good. And then you end up back back in Indonesia, and then so you, you switch from uh, Mondelez to to L'Oreal. How how did that so, transition yeah. happen? So I got a job in L'Oreal. Uh, again, another uh, uh, FMCG company, a fast-moving consumer product company, but with the focus in beauty. Um, I did slightly different what I did with, for, compared to what I did with the with the Mondelez before. Um, I did uh, I, at that time I, I, I learned how to manage a large key accounts so or large you know large retailers in, in Indonesia. So so yeah, so I, I spent another two years at L'Oreal before I moved to another company. Okay, and. How is that 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 process like? How does it compare? Um, obviously, it's a totally different industry and category, um, but like, were there a lot of different learnings from the old one that, that you brought to this one, or or what what sort of learnings did you have? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's different industry, but because I think because the way we run the, conduct the business between you know between FMCG manufacturers and retailers, uh, pretty much the same. So most of the knowledge that I know back then. In, in craft foods or mandolins, it's pretty much transferable to L'Oreal. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, you know, being equipped with, uh, with business skills, studying MBA, I think it also helps in a way to negotiate, um, you know, to uh, to think differently how, how you see the business, to take initiative, you know, um, build presentation as well, because you need to present a lot at L'Oreal. Um, those kind of skills definitely help me, you know, to survive at L'Oreal. But I, I have to say, it's not really a super stretch or super something that I have to adjust a really, really, um, really significant in, in that regard. So, um, yeah, because, you know, the language is the same, the culture is the same. I'm Indonesian anyway, so I know. So, so yeah. Sounds good. And then you uh, eventually made it to Japan at, at Google. So how, how does that, that seems quite a bit of a, of a different uh, area. How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Now I, I see the value of my MBA because I, I believe that, one of the reasons that Google called me because of my diploma as well from, you know, the, the MBA from the Rotterdam School of Management. So it, it was quite random, to be honest. It's just when I worked for L'Oreal, I know that there was something inside me that maybe I just want to, you know, um, do different things. Uh, maybe I'm, I want to work for smaller uh, FMCG companies, but, you know, becoming director or becoming senior manager, because uh, if I if I still wait at L'Oreal, maybe I have to wait, you know, um, many more years to, to climb up the corporate ladder. Uh, so I, I, I still look uh, at, you know, at different jobs in L'Oreal after after one and a half years. So I start to take a look at different jobs. One day came across to me, there is a vacancy at Google, but it seems like Google is advertising most of the business in Indonesia that I know of. And uh, but the title of the of the job is retail retail partner manager. So I was like, what what is this? The funny thing is that I, I obviously I read the job description, but I just you know like do a skim reading. I, I read it very quickly, and I just applied. I feel like okay, maybe there is a potential here. I just applied because sometimes you know you don't have to match hundred percent with the requirements, right? Uh, with the job requirements. So I just apply and that's it. Uh, within twenty four hours, I got called. I got emailed, and uh, within you know forty eight hours or. I, I did my yeah I did my first interview my first screening interview with the HR so it's pretty random to be honest and I never expected that I will move to Japan because I, I got this job actually. 
So pretty much, I just yeah read the job description. Uh, I just came reading. Uh, I, uh, and I, and I just applied the job, and within twenty four hours, I got the I got the interview in, invitation, and within the next forty eight hours from my first application, I got the, my first interview with the with the screening interview with the HR. So that's that's my journey with Google, and after that, I do another five six round of interviews take roughly maybe about two to three months to complete or even even further because at the time they, they also freeze hiring so there was a time when i have to wait okay. longer than that so after i think after maybe more than six months in total uh, so they finally offered me the job so it, it, it's it's been a it's been a quite a you know a challenging process as well because at that time i also got interviewed with other company and I, I need to make decision whether i need to move to google or other companies things like that but yeah, finally, I choose Google because I feel like uh, this is interesting for a large tech company to want to work to expand in the retail business. So I feel like there is a lot of learning here. And that's a good pivot as well, because because after I worked for Google, I just realized how how dynamic, how interesting technology industry is. So that's another pivot, pivotal point in my career, I would say. Sounds good. And if you can talk a little bit about the, the work culture in, let's say, Japan, uh, Tokyo versus like uh, Indonesia, how, how was the, how, how would you compare and contrast those? Yeah, that's interesting. That's, 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 that's I, I call it super stretch because I need to learn a lot. I need to adapt a lot to the <laughs> Japanese culture. Uh, I mean, my team is pretty much international because, because my team there, so um, it was pretty national because it was a, a Asia Pac regional headquarters. So I, there is a lot of people okay. from, you know, in other Indonesian, Korean, Japanese, uh, Taiwan, Taiwanese. So we use we use speak English in the, in the office. Uh, it's not like super Japanese, but obviously there is a certain certain type of Japanese element that you need to learn because my uh, the leader of my team is a, is a Japanese. So um, I think the difference with Indonesia, I think Japanese is pretty much um, they're very uh, low risk tolerance. That's number one. They're pretty careful in and pretty. Mm. Um, I would say pretty careful with uh, with the decisions that they don't know of. So if they don't know the situation, they're really, really careful and tend to be slow in making the decision. Uh, and they want everything is organized. So the process needs to be from very process oriented as well. So the process needs to be from step one to step two to step three. Well, when you're dealing with the partners in Indonesia, uh, there is no step one to three. Sometimes from step one until suddenly you, you jump into four, right? So. So okay. that kind of cultural differences is something that I need to explain and re-explain to my manager, which is also hard because, uh, you know, you need I need to adapt with my manager most of the time, not my manager adapt to me. Um, it's it's kind of hard for me, you know, sometimes to explain that to my manager. I think that's the biggest gap, uh, the the way Japanese people do the business versus Indonesian people do the business. Indonesian, I think it's um, pretty much laid back compared to Japanese. Um, Japanese, if they say A, they will do it. So. This is this is a difference. So in, in Japan, let's say I ask you, I ask Japanese, when can you deliver this? They will say next week. But actually, okay. they will send you the next day. If they say the next okay. day, it, they will send you in the next hour. It's very different with Indonesia, right? So in Indonesia, if they say the next day, it could be three days from now, right? It, so there is a bit of difference in terms of how you communicate your expectation. So that's the thing with Indonesia. I remember because at the time I still need to manage Indonesian business from Japan because I, I, I was tasked to grow the Google Play gift cards business in, in Southeast Asia market, uh, particularly Indonesia. So in Indonesia, let's say we want to launch, uh, let's say 1st of December. But, you know, in Japan with the Japanese manager, they will they will take that 1st December, December as a, as a you know, as a as a hard stop, you know, it's not like, it's not going to be changed. It's, it's going to be a first of December, but in Indonesia, sometimes, uh, maybe we cannot do it first of December. Maybe we can do it at seven of December. Those kind of stuff that I have to, you know, mm. really bridging the communication between Indonesian market and my Japanese leader. So that's a bit of, that's a massive challenge. I have to say at that time. Sounds good. That That's probably a whole uh, podcast episode on its own. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. And then you ultimately ended up in, in Canada. I, I'd love if you talk a little bit about that, that journey. Yeah, so I, sp I spent roughly about three and a half years in Google, oh, oh, close to four years, actually. So I do a lot of, again, self-learning, self-searching. What do I want to do? Because, you know, Japan is a fantastic place. I mean, Tokyo is a fantastic place to live, but working culture, it's it's really hard for me. And on top of that, I don't speak Japanese. I try to learn Japanese, but I think Japanese, uh, you know, uh, Japanese language is one of the hardest language in the world. 
it takes years for you to master. Um, and I, I, I know myself that I, I don't think I will live in Japan uh, forever at that time. Maybe, you know, if I really want to, you know, leave Japan because the, the difficult, you know, difficulties that I face in, in dealing with the work culture. Um, and I came across this, this decision that, okay, right now, if I move to another countries, it has to be English speaking because I don't want to have this language barrier anymore, given the fact that I work in sales and partnership. Uh, where you know language is important, so that's why I decided that if I if I if I move, I, it has to be an English speaking country. So a couple of countries that I see in a map. Obviously, you know, in my initial plan is to move internally within Google, but mm -hmm. with my background in consumer product, uh, most of the vacancies that they have actually it's in the Google US, where they have this large uh, hardware business at the time. So it's it's not easy for me as well to you know to enter that market, right? Um, after four years, I feel like. I don't want to, you know, spend another time doing this. And I just came to the realization that, okay, if I move to English speaking country, what, what, what are they and what do, what do they have, you know, for, you know, for immigrant like me? So I browse Australia, Canada, US, uh, UK, so and so forth. I never understand. And I never realized actually there is a permanent residence program in each of those countries. Not, not all country. I mean, US, they don't have it, but Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada. I think they they had they, ha they had at the time, so I never realized mm -hmm. that until that day when I just randomly Google uh, uh, in the evening after work. Oh, they have permanent residence, and I just try to understand how's the process, uh, what's the point based system, and so and so forth. And after that, I just you know uh, make a solid decision in my in myself like okay, I, I like U.S. market, and I think I want I still have the aspiration to go back to U.S. because when I initially when I want to do my MBA, I want to go to U.S. anyway. So right now, I feel like. I just want to go back to us but if i go to us there is no certainty that i could stay there so that's why i decided to move to canada because canada uh i can calculate my uh, permanent residence point and I, I can you know i can you know uh have more better calculations of what my possibility if i can stay in canada or not so that's why i i leave the job at google i continue back you know to study at queen's university in canada and uh long story short after three years i got my pr now in canada great yeah, so that brings us to kind of present day. And, and uh, as, as we start to close off this episode, we might do a deep dive into some of the other topics. But if you could share some of the swike, the stuff I wish I knew earlier for young graddy at various points in his time. So I don't know if you have big milestones, whether it be like the decision to go uh, uh, into uh, like the business side from engineering or maybe to, to go to a different business school or, or move around the world, whatever. Like what are some of the swike that you share for yourself? Yeah, a couple of things that I think I learned throughout, throughout my career. Uh, number one, I think I remember uh, back back in those days when I, when I when I want to take on my MBA, uh, there is a you know uh, I also have a lot of things that I need to do in my personal life. So I think one number one thing is that put a single focus. If you if you if you want to work on your personal life first, and then you want to delay or you want to take a take a break or take a pause for your on your professional life, do it. So you know uh, you're not you're focused. So you're not you're not uh, Dividing your attention, I think that's one of the learning things that uh, that that uh, you know that's one of the most uh, thing. I think one of the mistakes that I did at the time is that because I want to do uh, juggle a lot of things at, at the at, in, at you know at the same time. I mean, if you're able to manage it, feel free to do it. But but for me, I feel like put a single focus. I think it's it's better. So at the time, for example, uh, when I want to do my MBA, I also have a lot of things that I want to do personally in my in my personal life. So. It, you know, it, it kind of distract my, you know, my ability to, to get a good school in, in the U.S. Um, as well. So that's number one. Uh, put a single focus in your journey. Uh, you need to have a plan. Uh, when I say plan, not, not necessarily you have to plan the next five, ten years. I think that's that's impossible, given the given the uh, especially the the nature of the change that we, we've seen in our world today. It's kind of hard for you to plan too long. But at least for the next one two years, if you have if you have certain things that you want to acquire, just make sure you focus on that first. Uh, I think that's that's number one and number two is that always long thing long term um and evaluate whether the next step that you take will open more doors or not for you because once you grow older uh by default you know the opportunities that will be open up for you will be limited but if you're able to take a next step in which that next steps enable you to to be exposed in different fields or different areas or enrich your career i think that's something that you need to you, you know to to think about uh, for example, changing, uh, you know, um, building expertise in different functions in, in your career. Let's say you master marketing and then you master sales. And then let's say you master strategy. 
although you got older, but if you have built that expertise over a period of time, I think you will be a very attractive talent uh, for employer because you have been exposed to many different fields and you are you have proven uh, to be successful in each role. Uh, I think that's also important. Um, also, the number three, I think, do not do not say no right away if you're not sure. Uh, always ask hmm. for more time to think. Um, this is one of the mis- one of the mistake that I did when I after I, I graduated from uh, RSM in the Netherlands. I got called at a time by L'Oreal from their head office in a, in the in the Paris, and they said that I, I saw your profile from the uh, RSM uh, 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 alumni book, and actually I like your profile and I want to interview you. Uh, we don't have a role in in Europe at this moment, but if you want to go to Asia, we, we can we can uh, we can talk about it. And uh, if you're interested, then uh, I would like like to speak with you. At that time, maybe maybe what because in my heart I just say I want to put a single focus, right? I just want to stay in Europe, no matter how you know the, the recession or the crisis in Europe. But it, eventually, that it didn't work out for me, and I have to go back to Indonesia. And I work for L'Oreal anyway, so at that time, I think if I'm being wise, I just say. Hey, can I think it for, for a while and uh, can I get back to you again? Because I think this is not an easy decision for me. I think I regret it a lot because I feel like my career trajectory could be changed uh, significantly if I work for L'Oreal in their APAC headquarters, for example. So so that's mm-hmm. that's another thing that I, I, I learned. Um, and maybe the last thing is that uh, environment is extremely important. Um, right now, after I live in four different countries, I just realized how being physically present in different environment, it helps to shape you. Simple stuff, for example, language. Um, obviously, uh, my English uh, is not as good as now, com- you know, compared to let's say ten years ago, because I I'm exposed in in a country where I have to use language, English speaking, you know, English as a as a main language. So, being being exposed in the in a different environment, especially environment that you work you want to be in, I think that's that's important. Uh, learning from that, I, I actually if if I can take my MBA earlier, I will do it earlier, not just after five years, seven years of working experience. Maybe I'll do it after two years mm-hmm. of working experience because I think that enables me to get the head start to live in a different places. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of good advice. That That's one of those things where, so if we go kind of in re- reverse order, uh, working in, in another place, that's one thing that, that I regret uh, not doing as, as well. Um, and uh, working in a different country, because I, I do think that exposure to different environments, different experiences can be quite uh, shaping for y- yourself and, and uh, just uh, not not even just on a career side, but pr- probably from life uh, outcomes and expectations as well. Um, when you say, like, don't say no right away, um, I think it kind of almost is counter to that first one about uh, having a single focus. So I guess to pair those two, it's having a single focus, but be flexible, right? So so yeah, uh, exactly. don't say no That's, right away on that, yeah. I think would be would be a good way to put it. Um, and then that thinking long term, sure. Um, and, and these plans, they don't have to be concrete in terms of like thou shalt and you must do this. Again, back to that being flexible, like you might have these long-term plans but then realizing that you can change them after after a while because i have folks do an exercise which i call like their retirement memo and basically say like what sh- would your career be like if you were as successful and 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 happy and whatever as as you uh, ever dreamed that you would be um and then understand that that's you in a snapshot uh when at a point in time but it can change and it can be totally different um and then if you go back to that single focus, like some people like focusing on different things. Most people like a little bit of variety. So maybe do like an 80-20 type of thing, 80% of one thing. And then you can have a little bit of uh, stuff on the side to just kind of uh, have a little bit of variety. But I think a lot of that is, is great, uh, great guidance and, and swike and, and advice. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time. If uh, folks want to connect with you, when where should they do so? And then what are some future aspirations that uh, we can look forward to hearing from you uh, in the future? Yeah, uh, feel free to connect with me with LinkedIn. Uh, so just my name, if you search on LinkedIn, Grady. Uh, my middle name is Pratomo, P-R-A-T-O-M-O. So Grady Pratomo Gunawan. I think you, if you browse my name in LinkedIn, it will come up. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, feel free to connect with me with LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, my future career aspir- aspiration as of now, uh, definitely I, I still want to be in the North American market, not just in Canada, but you know, if I can have a opportunities sometimes in the future to move to the US and to learn US market, uh, that will be my other aspiration. Uh, the other thing is that because most of the time, uh, I always work in large multinational companies. Even now my current company, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of a, it's a subsidiary of a part of a global conglomerate as well. So, um, 
if I if I do a checks box, the type of company that I work for is always large multinational. I never work for startup. I never work for medium sized companies. So um, I think after this, if if I have the right opportunities, maybe I want to move to mid sized companies or maybe startup uh, because I think there is a different skill set that I could learn uh, in those environment as well. Um, I think that's that's two things that I could uh, that I want to be. Um, and on, on top of that, you know, being a right now. I, I'm, I lead a team of eight, so it, it really sharpens the way my leadership skill. Obviously, I mean, leadership does not mean that you have to lead people. I mean, being an individual contributor does not mean that you have you, you cannot have leadership skills. But, mm -hmm. but sometimes when you're exposed to as a people manager, it puts a lot of more um, pressure in you to perform as a, as a manager, right? Because people look up to you, people need your advice, and you need to give them example. Uh, I think I want to sharpen the skill even more. I want not just in leading people, but also determining the, the future of a company. So if I can move to mid-size, uh, smaller companies, so I will have more uh, influential or substantial decision for the company. And I think that's that's the thing that I look for because, it, you know, at the end of the day, as a, as a business, business business person, um, you are measured by how good you make making decision, right? Um, and and mm -hmm. I, I just want to have a track record on in, in that area as of now. Sounds good. Awesome. So uh, thanks so much, Grady, for sharing your, your insights, your, your experience. And uh, yeah, ho hopefully we'll, we'll have you back for a future episode. Thank you, Lukit. And thank you so much you know, for having me. Uh, I enjoy this conversation a lot. Take care. Thanks for joining us on the Swike Stuff I Wish I Knew Earlier, the podcast. If you like the podcast, please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you found this podcast. And if you can give us a review, that would be very appreciated. Feel free to contact me on LinkedIn at Luki Danu, L-U-K-I-D-A-N-U, and the same on most social media platforms. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Bye.